as we know, we're not going to be growing more farmland. So we're going to have to produce way more products from the existing farmland and find ways to increase our, our productivity to feed a hungry world, which is what's coming at us. Funding for Built on Agriculture is provided in part by Manitoba Government, Growing Forward 2, a federal, provincial, territorial initiative, Government of Canada, MacDon Industries, Monsanto, Canada, the Bicentenary of the Red River Selkirk Settlement Committee, and the members of Prairie Public. Lord Selkirk undertook a great risk in settling the Highland clans in the Red River area. Through determination and agricultural practice, the settlers were able to succeed beyond their wildest expectations. But as the times have changed, so have the challenges. Now farmers are faced with many obstacles they must overcome to continue feeding the world. For over 200 years, Agriculture has been fundamental to the development of settlement in Manitoba. On the arrival of the Selkirk settlers, they established the first agricultural settlement in Manitoba by Europeans. And since those days, it has flourished in this province. It remains an important part of our history and an important dimension of our future development as a province. People have been migrating off of farms and into cities and towns and the world just surpassed that threshold where the majority of the world's population now lives in cities. There's fewer and fewer people on the farm feeding more and more people in the city and I think that that trend is likely to continue. I think the big driver for agriculture now is where we've just surpassed seven billion people on this planet and we're moving to nine billion. And the nine they anticipate will happen about 2050. Some of the experts are certainly anticipating that the worldwide supply demand curve will continue to be strong for the foreseeable future. The high price of land will be a challenge to the next generation of farmers. If I was starting a farm today, typically I would be starting probably with a relative. In a sense, you're trading the, the lack of money for sweat equity. And then that's how I started with my dad. I didn't, have, I didn't have a penny. It was my dad's money that we stuck into this farm. The price of land has increased very, very quickly. With, the, with a bit of increase in grain price, we often see that. There is some young people who are finding cropland that they can acquire and gradually work their way and build their way into it, but it's, it's a growing challenge for that to happen. As we see more and more young people uh, migrating to the cities for jobs, there's more demand on the parents and on the rest of the family to produce more crop per acre than what was ever done before in order to be profitable and to exist. The future is unlimited. These businesses uh, have a high demand for skilled people and for individuals that have a genuine regard, enthusiasm for production agriculture, that feel comfortable in that environment and increasingly sophisticated customers. Uh, but it's a global business. On the same hand, it's all about production agriculture and human food consumption on a global basis. In just over a decade, agricultural engineers have discovered new and innovative methods of farming. 
With these advances in technology, farmers have seen the size of their equipment and farms grow beyond what was believed possible. Because the equipment now has computer technology and wireless telecommunications, satellite technology, we have started to provide services where we are now monitoring the equipment remotely. In some instances, we know when a piece of equipment is going to fail before the farm manager knows. Guys I know locally, friends of mine who are tremendous farmers here in this area of Manitoba, they're not steering that machine. They're on their iPads and their cell phones checking what's going on in the world relative to their crops and their applications. The, the technology is phenomenal and how they apply it to their farm operation. We're starting to really get into technology since we've been expanding and we're finding new things, especially with the new mobile phones. It's really helping us for planning, for record keeping and things like that on our farm. And that's been something that's really been a plus. Um, I just keep record of everything that's going on in the phone. So we've got a program here called Farm at Hand. One of the technologies that has developed along with large machinery size is precision agriculture, which gives farmers the chance to meter out different rates of fertilizer in different portions of the field, to look at different rates of pesticide applied in different areas of the field, even to gauge crop growth. Some of this precision agriculture technology has enabled large-scale farming to still farm on a really site-specific basis. Uh, farmer Hand keeps record of everything that we're doing on the farm from what we're putting on the field as far as inputs, uh, taking everything off, yields, what bins we're keeping them in, moisture, everything. We started to look at combine work activity last year and pulling that data and how the efficiencies of operators changed or within the same field were different and why. GPS is one of the most major breakthroughs in agriculture. Most of it we're using on our farm is for guidance. And if we have a tractor without GPS, I don't know whether I have an operator for that. If you measure everything, you now have very good knowledge. And so what do you need to do to ensure that I'm, I'm maximizing every single piece of equipment across the farm? On this, it's showing our moisture here, our average moisture, uh, instant bushels per acre, so we're coming up at about 70. At some point in time, we will get to a point where you will program that piece of equipment to do a task in the field, and it will get the job done and operate itself. If we start to move towards more autonomous equipment where you don't need a operator in that piece of equipment, could you get away with smaller equipment but have more of it in the field? I could see that coming in the future. Climatologists across the world have discovered that farmers are faced with an environmental problem that could lead to serious issues to the future of farming. Weather is what we get over a short period of time. Climate is what you expect to happen over longer periods of time. Climate change, therefore, indicates that what you expect is changing. Climate change is something that is going to be affecting us more and more. And I know in my short lifetime, I've seen a lot of change in our seasons and our weather conditions. If that continues, we don't know if it's going to be a continual high water problem, which would mean we have flood problems on a permanent basis, or if it will be a water scarcity problem. The risk of drought is my number one concern for the prairies. When we look at what the climate models are saying about the coming decades, our number one worry is water. Not too much water, but not enough water. Drought and wet periods, or floods if you will, are a normal part of our climate and they always will be. But the worrisome thing for me is that climate models suggest that not only will the summers get warmer, if that comes along with drier summers, that tells me drought. It's almost inevitable that no matter where we travel in the developing world, when we talk to farmers, they will say something to the effect that, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, from my fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers, they always knew that the rains came at a certain date, 
And now they say the rains don't come then anymore. Water scarcity is our number one limiting resource. And getting twice the crop per drop is what they're saying we need to do around the world to feed the world going into the future. And what we're going to be doing is uh, using research and technology to help improve productivity and profitability for farmers. Uh, what I'll be starting is doing surveying and installing tile drainage. Uh, from that, we're hoping to hold water that's coming off the field, um, test to see what's happening with phosphorus. We're hoping to multiply it and then reimburse that water that has phosphorus from runoff and nitrates back onto our field through irrigation. But properly installed tile is going to help in a dry or a wet year. We're not removing moisture that's actually going to dry the fields out too much. We're only taking off water that's going to actually hurt crop development. So having all this water might be a tremendous asset. 20% of all the fresh water in North America flows through Manitoba on average, sometimes more. So this is a real uh, ace in the hole if you can capitalize on storing some of that water when it's here at the wrong time and then use it through the growing season we may be in a position to really be a dominant player in world food production. The growing season right now is about a whole month longer than it was around 1900, and it's a good change. The data clearly shows that this is going to continue so that maybe in 40 years or so, we'll have another month added to that frost-free season. But the agronomist will tell you that one of the consequences of that is that Although you might be allowed to plant your crops earlier, that means that the maturation dates of your crops are also changing. And those may not necessarily line up with the precipitation patterns that we've come accustomed to. Researchers have discovered ways to produce foods that yield more per acre, even in extreme conditions, through genetic modifications. It's a double-edged sword when you talk about genetically modified foods. On one hand, one has a changing environment, almost unquestionably now, either through drought, but also through temperature variations, means it's harder for producers, for farmers, to have yields consistently. By modifying the genetics around a plant, one can make them more robust, more hardy, but of course, there are other drawbacks in that process and one has to be very careful. When we start to look at the types of risks that are associated with this technology, they often fall into two camps. There's a science-based risk, in the field risk, but there's also a social, cultural and economic risk that isn't even talked about when we talk about risk assessment of this technology. Do the plants function the same way as a regular plant in the field? And for the most part, they do, they look the same, they function the same as the plant, but the trick with this is that they're genetically different. And we're just starting to understand the full complexity of what genomes can do. And so when you insert a gene into a new genetic context, we don't necessarily understand the full implications of that. I think history has shown that we've had 17 years now of GM crops being grown across fairly broadly across North America, and we have not had any adverse effects. Uh, so this technology is safe, so if people are concerned about it that way, I think uh, we've got a really good track record uh, and a strong regulatory system to ensure that those products are safe before they're released. The GM crops that we grow have, have helped us get higher yields, uh, they've helped us deal with some disease, and, and they've helped us you know, be able to plant these crops and be able to succeed as a small business. If we hadn't modified uh, nature and agriculture 50 to 100 years ago, we wouldn't even be on the prairies. So everything is modified in, in some way. Genetic modification is just a practical application of science to agriculture. We embrace science and we embrace innovation and we embrace biotechnology in absolutely every aspect of our life. Why wouldn't we embrace it in agriculture and why wouldn't we give those same benefits to farmers and to food production to help make our food better? I think this technology is very interesting. I think it has huge promise for the future of society if it is used properly. If we take into account that there's a larger public good that needs to be offered if we're going to crack into the genetic structure of living organisms. It can't be for profit. If we do it because it might increase food 
for people. It might help with health issues. It might allow us to transcend some of the ecological problems that we face. Those are laudable reasons to use the technology. The technology is not good or bad. It's how it's used. I'm scared that consumers won't give farmers the freedom to be able to access those tools and those innovations that can help make a difference, right? So I would argue that farmers need more choices, more options. Yes, they need to be regulated. Yes, they need to be proven to be safe. But we need innovation in order to progress. There are people that think we should go back to how our grandparents used to farm. That's a nice viewpoint, but it's not going to feed 9 billion people. Advances in food science has proven to produce more food on less land. Researchers are now discovering ways to make food more nutritious. Through scientific studies of individual diets, these scientists have discovered key ingredients for personal nutrition. I think we all know that there is going to be a food shortage, that we're going to have to really be concerned in the future, and that we have to start considering this food to be nutritional, to be nutrient dense, that we have to think about how this is going to affect people on a worldwide level. We have very significant investments in the kinds of foods that people want to eat. There's a greater shift now towards healthier foods, and we have one of the best research consortiums in the world. Agriculture appears to be moving towards higher production and higher health benefits. We're seeing this from all commodity groups. They really want to be looking at human health benefits. Nutraceuticals and functional foods is actually the road to go down. It is the next evolution and taking these ingredients and putting them into the foods themselves and preventing some of the diseases and effects that we're going to experience down the road as we age, we can do a great uh, service to the consumers, to health care, to the governments. There's lots of snake oil out there too. This is the biggest problem with this industry is, is there's so many products out there that, that claim health benefits and don't have the hard scientific evidence to back it up. There's such a lot of scientific data now that speaks to how, depending on how you reach out in the supermarket, you can really impact your body's metabolic state and therefore its risk to certain degenerative disease. As a research scientist, I'm thinking of that consumer all the time as, as the Canadian public, as, as worrying about pressure on our healthcare system, that all of this science needs to get to the people who need to benefit from it. The benefit to the consumer of research in this agriculture continuum that spans from the farm to the fork, we're really getting a better hold on how the various ingredients found in these commodities can make us healthier and improve wellness of Canadians overall. The Canadian International Grain Institute, otherwise known as SIGI, is teaching farmers what their crops are being used for across the world. By promoting this knowledge, farmers can continue to provide nations with the highest quality grains. So we take this current knowledge, this currency of knowledge that we've got, and it's only useful if you give it to people, eh? Today we've got a program here with 25 pretty senior farmers from all across Western Canada, helping them understand how their grain that they're producing is used by their customers around the world. So this is our pasta and extrusion plant, and our main focus here is uh, derby. Part of extending that global market knowledge that we've got, that's the big role that Siggy's got making sure that our customers, or potential customers for Canadian field crops, understand we're growing some of the very best, safest, healthiest food in the world. These provincial food development centers are critical to moving innovation forward into the marketplace. As the world's population continues to grow, distribution of food will become critical. I don't want to be the one, I don't think anybody wants to be the one who decides who gets to eat and who doesn't get to eat. It's a very, very hard concept for North Americans to understand because we've never been hungry. 
It's not always the case for other people. Food Grains Bank got started in the mid-70s. It started because there were famines and food needs in Asia and Africa, but here in North America, particularly in Canada, there was food surplus. We need to think really seriously, not just about what we have and what we want, but what is best for people who don't have the same access and the same luxuries that we do. The Canadian government is one of the most stable and generous funders of uh, food aid in the world. The government has made a commitment to make sure that there is money available every year for humanitarian assistance, for food assistance, to make sure that people around the world have food to eat. We should always be concerned about, about feeding the world. The population is over 7 billion and, and continues to rise. Although there have been major, major increases in you know, crop productivity and expansion around the world, the specter of climate change, it's worrisome what it might do to that, those benefits, those gains that we've made in feeding the world's population. So we're trying to figure out how can you produce more food on that same amount of land or less land in order to meet the demands of a growing world. And obviously we don't suffer from food shortages here, but if you look at the developing world, which is the fastest growing area of biotech crop production, it is the difference between life and death or feeding your family or being able to send your child to school. We, of course, would like to see everyone in the world have enough food to eat. And we would like for everyone everywhere in the world to have access to all the food they need to lead healthy and active lives. Lord Selkirk would be justifiably proud of his agricultural experiment on the Northern Great Plains. Aided by education and technology, today's farmers seem equal to the challenge of feeding us and the world. And they were told this is a land of ice and snow, it's fur country, and you can't farm here, it's not possible. Land that you could have and it could be yours and yours alone and it was free and it was free to you. If you worked hard, nobody would take it away from you. Thomas Fifth Earl of Selkirk was an idealist and a philanthropist and he inherited a very large fortune and he used that fortune to charter ships to Red River Settlement which turned out to be the beginning of Winnipeg. The hardships were huge. They had uh, huge challenges. And without the support of Chief Peguis and his people, they would have starved. The ownership of land and the respect for property, that was something that was really important to the Selkirk settlers and why they were so determined to persevere in the face of all these hardships. What of course sparked the settlement in any kind of numbers and in any kind of volume was the building of the CPR. Sir John A. Macdonald's intention was to tie the country together. It's been said that if men were the pioneers, women were the settlers. They were the ones that created a home and they were doing this all the time while they were caring for and producing children. Winnipeg was the gateway to Western Canada, and it was the headquarters of the agricultural business in Western Canada, particularly the grain trade. Almost 90% of all of the grain in Canada was delivered to the cooperatives. Today there are no more cooperatives. In my personal opinion, the wheat board was a, a perfect tool. I didn't have to wake up in the morning and think, oh, where's the market today? The idea that the farmer cannot sell his own property, I found it abhorrent. There's an old saying in risk management, if, if you don't manage your risks, they can very well end up managing you. The biggest factor that affects how well my farm produces is the weather, and I can't control it. That's a tough game to be in, if the biggest influencing factor you can't control. I'm extremely passionate about farming. It's something that I, I wake up every day thinking about. It's something that on my off time, I spend time researching. We're there for planting the seed. We're watching to make sure that it's growing and we're there to harvest it and watch something that we've done in the beginning of the year and see how it turns out in the output in the end. And we're there along every step of the way. We can't always count on the financial rewards to carry us through. So sometimes we need the passion. We just need the plain grit <laughs> to get us through some of the more difficult times. If we have a tractor without GPS, I don't know whether I have an operator for that. 
there are people that think we should go back to how our grandparents used to farm. That's a nice viewpoint, but it's not going to feed 9 billion people. Food is sort of the baseline. It means just having what you need so that you can pursue the life that you dream of or that you hope for for your children. Funding for Built on Agriculture is provided in part by Manitoba Government, Growing Forward 2, a federal, provincial, territorial initiative, Government of Canada, MacDon Industries, Monsanto, Canada, the Bicentenary of the Red River Selkirk Settlement Committee, and the members of Prairie Public. To order a copy of the four-part series, Built on Agriculture, call 1-800-359-6900 or visit our online store at prairiepublic.org.